you had a good reading week. Um, so we're looking at Prince Caspian, uh, the fourth of our uh, tour of the Chronicles of Narnia. It is uh, presented as the fourth in the recent editions of the series, <coughs> but it was the second of the novels published and called The Return to Narnia. So the su I put this up here because of the subtitle as much as anything. Uh, called A Story for Children. Uh, so very specifically, unlike his science fiction trilogy and other works, this really is uh, written for children and uh, intended for it. And it's sequenced according to an internal chronology in the books. Uh, and as it suggests, it constitutes a return to Narnia. Now, so we're looking at it as the fourth in the series. We looked at uh, a magician, the magician's nephew, uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Horse and His Boy. Now we'll do Caspian. Next time we'll do Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Silver Chair, Last Battle. Uh, that's how they are presented within the internal chronology, not published that way. But this is the book in which he does something a little different than any of the others. This tale is dominated by men. There are magical beings, but by and large, it's the world of men that dominates this. And it is only one year later in terms of the chronology in England. So the Pevensey children are a, a year older, uh, back at school uh, when this adventure happens. And um, actually, they're not back at school, but they, they're a year older. And they're brought back into Narnia, but Narnia, the Narnia they're brought back into is 1,300 years later. So the discrepancy of time there is something that we're now acquainted with. Um, and it, again, if it's the second published novel, the first being The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you see a, a significant lag there. The, the children are a year older, and that will have some effect because we'll see the way in which the children um, greet Aslan or refuse to be able to see him or have struggles with seeing him as something to do with their age. <laughs> and that's going to become a theme that he will build on uh, over the course of time. By the time he gets to the last battle, Susan no longer is interested in Aslan. That's not here. But we can see already that the with age, there is a, uh, a receptivity to this realm of Narnia, or with age, there's a lack of recept receptivity to some degree. And that's a theme that he's going to build upon and relate it to some degree to a, uh, the ability of children to receive things uh, and understand them and live in a world uh, of their own imagination. So it's a very romantic theme in some ways, which is why Lewis and Tolkien are often called Christian romantics. I, t I tend to take issue with that for other reasons, but I understand why people are saying that. They're talking about the innocence of youth and their ability to receive truths that contradict the accepted norms of adulthood. And here in this world of Prince Caspian, we have adults that don't believe the old tales of Narnia. They're, they're, they've passed into myth and legend, and nobody believes them anymore. They're the subject of mockery. And so Lewis is doing something different with this tale than he was in the previous. Here he's dealing with um, something like Jack Lewis before he converted, where he loved the old myths and loved the old stories, but thought that they were lies breathed through silver, basically. They're not, I love them, but they're not true. And that's the adult, mature 20th century perspective on these sorts of stories. And so when he writes this to some degree, he's, he's speaking to that adult world of his contemporaries that regards all myths as really being at some removed from truth, if not altogether uh, contradicting the adult norms and rules of what constitutes uh, the real world. And yet he wants to not only present something alternative to it, not only for children, he is going to see, to some degree, be involved in what he 
sketches out, and I encourage you to read this, although I haven't put it until the end of the course. His little essay, The Weight of Glory, talks about the need to uh, cast a spell. And one way you could see this, these Chronicles of Narnia, is in casting a spell and weaving a spell, um, presenting a, uh, a fictional world uh, for children to believe in and love and get lost in, um, and yet it's not for adults. And, and we're not to make, it's just entertainment. And I think um, it's clear from what you read in Lewis that, first of all, he doesn't believe that that's true. And even though this is directed at children, uh, I think he has a greater purpose in mind than simply having children to read it. He enjoys reading this sort of literature himself. And uh, there's something being said that's very true for children that is equally true for adults. So there are two sides to the myth making or the spell casting in this. And the one of them is sort of counterintuitive, and it's that he thinks that the world of men that he describes the telemarines living under is under a spell. It's already under a spell. It's not been disenchanted. In the Christian world right now, there's a lot of talk about the, re uh, the need to re-enchant the world after the Enlightenment is disenchanted, it has abolished all ritual and myth and legend and the significance of the Tao and so forth and the idea that the whole cosmos is the work of God and there's something supernatural in the midst of the natural and we need to recover that but and lewis firmly believes in that and both lewis and tolkien present that but if you read the weight of glory he actually says that the most powerful spells are often those that break enchantments not just cast them but break them and i think that's what's going on and that's that's the intent here i don't know if it's an apologetic intent it's but a, a an authorial intent here is to break the spell of atheistic materialism and reductionism. He wants to break that spell. Because he thinks it is a spell, it's propaganda, and it's connected to education. The reduction of what, we con what constitutes human learning and, and education and higher learning, these are all connected. And that's part of why I began the whole uh, lecture series by looking at the discarded image. I wanted to show something of the richness of that image, which he's trying to recapture in his own works. <clears throat> and it's not that he wants us to believe in that world or live in that world because he doesn't believe that it's true either, as it was, th as it was then constituted. It's not scientifically verifiable, much of what was held. And yet there's, there's also something fictional about what we regard as scientifically true in our day and he's trying to get us to see the fact that if you want to use the language worldviews are provisional and to some degree they depend on casting a spell for people to find them plausible and we believe that materialism is plausible when i say we lewis does not and maybe we don't either but our contemporaries do <clears throat> they're reductionist materialists they think that a uh, good biological theory is simply biochemical. You know, the, 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 what R Richard Dawkins calls the selfish gene in that book, that uh, to understand life, we just need to understand it in its material chemical complexity, and that will explain the variety of life forms that we see around us. But it's all, it all can be reduced to material. And so that even in the realm of psychology, the most reductionist forms regard psychology to be a study of brain chemistry. And so the problem with your, um, your behavior, with your, uh, your, your psychology is actually a biochemical problem. So we're going to treat it with biochemical means. And so the brain, the study of psychology is the brain. Well, this is, a, this is one branch of psychology, by the way. And it's, it's in our way, in our day, the most dominant one, probably because a, a lot of money can be made in pushing pills. I think that's one of the main reasons. And it's not that there's not, there's, so for Christians on this, I don't want to get off topic on this, but there's no reason why a Christian shouldn't think that biochemistry has something to do with it because we are physical beings. Biochemistry is a part of our makeup. 
what I would say we can't accept is the reduction of uh, the problems of human psychology or even the goal of the human person is to be reduced to such materialistic things or the complexity of a person's soul is to be reduced to biochemical things. That, that seems to me to be the, the real problem there. It's sort of like alchemy, what Lewis said about alchemy, or even astro uh, astrology. They held some significance to the material things, but they were unwilling to grant that it's deterministic and fatalistic. But you can see the constellation of the planets have an influence on the Earth every time the moon waxes, the, the tides go with it. You can see there's an influence there. It's a hidden one, but it's obvious, visible. And we, so much the greater in the, the higher constellations, the higher planets, they have a, a, an influence on things. But is it deterministic so that if you're born under this and that star, that you're fated to have a, either a glorious future or a terrible outcome? just because you were born under this constellation of planets. The ancients and the medievals would say absolutely not. Certainly the Christians will say absolutely not. The pagans might say you are actually. <laughs> but they, uh, uh, hence Oedipus, he was fated to do this. There was no way around the fates. But in the, the Christian um, transformation of that worldview, while they think that astronomy and astrology might tell you something, it's not going to be uh, deterministic. There are forces that are above and outside of that that can change things, and that's because of God's providence, God not being bound by space and time. Right? He's not trapped in the physical universe that he creates. His being is outside of space and time. Otherwise, he'd be implicated in the fall, in the fall of creation when the, when the earth is corrupted, human nature corrupted. Everything created is corrupted by it. Well, then he would be corrupted if he were in, implicated in that, but he's not. He's presented that his being is outside space and time. He's eternal. He's not finite, whereas everything that we see, however vast it is, is finite in some way. Um, and, and so we mustn't see it in, in that way, but Lewis is trying to push back against the spell of modernity for lack of a better word, that wants to reduce everything to the, let's say, adult or scientific way of looking at life. So that's what I think he's confronting here in the telemarines. This is a people who have banished myth and even the telling of the myths. They're extremely hostile to it. You might want to see a corollary uh, in Tennyson's Lady of Shalott, which I read with you in first year if you were with me. There's something like that going on. It's the 19th century belief in progress, which is also tied to a reductionist, materialistic worldview. And that characterizes the Telmarines. And interestingly, um, our four protagonists from the lion and the witch and the wardrobe are brought into this world 1300 years after they were last there and magically whisk, whisked away from a British railway station uh, to a beach by a ru ru old and ruined castle. How do they get there? Why are they there? The first time they did it of their own volition by going through the wardrobe, which we know from the first novel was, was constructed out of a tree that was in the garden. It was cut down and it was made into this magical wardrobe. That's not how they get there this time. So Lewis is already introducing, if this is the second novel he's written, it's the fourth we're looking at, and it's the fourth in the series, that there are many ways into this other world of Narnia. And this one is not through a portal, it's through a call from another world. There's a, been a cry from Narnia for, the, for help, and they've been called as the means of assistance. So they find themselves being pulled. And they're, they're, they're films of this now, but they're feel, they, and they can't resist it. They're not intentionally going into something that they're oblivious to. They know where they're going. They have a sense, uh-oh, I'm getting dragged there again. They end up there. They are not sure where it is because it doesn't look anything like it once did. Well, they find themselves in an old and ruined castle, and they don't even know that it's Care Paravel 
where they once reigned as kings and queens of Narnia. They don't, they don't even recognize it because it's decrepit, it's in ruins. And it takes them a while to figure out that it is, in fact, that place. And at that point, um, they start to realize the time factor that must have taken place for that. And then, well, what, what is going... So it's a mystery to them, it's a mystery to us as well. It's part of what makes the story compelling is there's a, this mysterious sense of nostalgia, the returning back to this place that they loved where they were kings and queens, unlike back in England where they were school kids and no one regards them very highly, although they go back as better children than they came in. And that's an interesting aspect of the, the Tau there. Remember the land of Narnia is the land where the Tau rules, where everybody accepts it and virtue is rewarded and vice is punished. It's a very black and white world, unlike the world where they are living, where in the school system, they are denying that the Tao even exists, hence the abolition of man, right? The first chapter, that's the world they've left where, where virtue is in a sense, not just disregarded, but to some degree punished. And, and vice is allowed to flourish because effectively they see no real difference between virtue and vice. But when they come back from Narnia, they're better children because now they realize that there is good and evil at work, not just in that world, but in them and therefore in the world that they are going back to. So again, Lewis is giving us a sort of a um, active parable about how stories of places of virtue and vice can transform children to be better people. So read these old stories believe that in the truth of the battle against evil and you will be a valiant warrior against evil in your own world even though they deny it because they're under a spell the spell that denies that virtue is a real thing but that is a sort of a spell it's a very powerful spell to say that good and evil aren't real the devil doesn't exist god doesn't exist what a spell that is he'll come back to that in the silver chair when they go down to the underland Right? There's a spell going on there. It sits in the silver. I'll, I'll get to that when we, in a couple of classes when we look at the silver chair. But that, that same um, casting of a spell that makes people believe what's true is false and what's false is true. And what's evil is good and what's good is evil. That sort of spell which characterizes the 20th century and the 21st for that matter. So they, they go back to Care Paravel, not realizing that that's where they are at first. And they, what once they do, they go down to a treasure vault, and there they discover a couple, a couple of items. Now, the items that they discover are important. And again, this is part of heroic uh, literature often. They find uh, treasures that are um, fit for heroes. In this case, they find Peter's sword. They don't find all of the implements. Remember, Aslan gives them these gifts. But they find Peter's sword, and they also find um, Anne's shield, and they find Susan's bow and arrows. They find Lucy's dagger and also the bottle of magical cordial. But one thing's missing, and that's Susan's uh, horn for summoning help. That's missing, but that's how they got there. But the horn was blown. They called for help. Who blew the horn? How did that person know? Was it accidental? As it turns out, no. It was an old wise teacher who believed the old stories about Narnia. And the figure that has blown the trumpet is none other than Trumpkin the Dwarf, whom they then rescue as he's about to be drowned by the telemarine soldiers. And he then gives this a sort of, so it's a sort of an epic narrative in the sense that they begin in the middle of things. Like they're right at the point where the figure that believes in the truth of the kings and queens of Narnia has blown the horn that will call them back, which is a crazy thing to do, to believe that, that that's going to happen. But he really believes there's some sort of magic 
in that horn. And uh, he's about to perish for having done this. And they magically appear at that point and rescue him. And one of the arrows uh, is shot and they, you know, hit them in the head from a great distance. Don't have, even have to kill them. And when they save them, then we start getting the story. And it's, it's at that point something like Odysseus recounting the story of how he got to that point. He'll tell his odyssey that brought them to that point where uh, they get effectively a potted history of Narnia uh, from the time that they were there reigning as kings and queens to the present. So there's 1,300 years of Narnian history uh, during which the Telemarines had conquered Narnia. And under their rule, we now have a king and a queen, King Miraz and his wife, Queen Prunas, Pruna Prismia, quite the name. And he had usurped his brother, uh, brother's throne by killing him. And that king's name was none other than King Caspian the Ninth, father of King Prince Caspian, whom we will meet after which the book is named. But we have a long line of kings then. And now we have the pretty much an ancient story of a unlawful ruler usurping a lawful ruler, a sort of a Shakespearean theme pulled in here. Then lot, lots of other precedents as well, but Shakespeare loves these sorts of things. You would think Prospero in um, you know, the, the Tempest, but, but many other of Shakespeare's plays where you have a rightful ruler who uh, is taken advantage of by a wicked brother. And so a grave injustice. At that point now what we have is a, uh, the degeneration of politics. So it's not just like, because... It's not just they blow the horn after 1,300 years and it's been lost and it's only been retained by creatures naive enough to believe in the old stories. There's a political event that has uh, led to this outcome as well, and it's the usurpation of a legitimate ruler by an unlawful one. So there's sort of a political context, which is very interesting. I don't think it's just background here. Um, and Caspian does not know that his father has been murdered by his brother. He doesn't know it. And because his father was loved by his people, his uncle has left him alive. Maybe he's Hamlet. He's the prince of Denmark, he's the equivalent. And his uncle, I mean, the difference is that he's not married his mother or anything like that, but, the, but his uncle uh, has left him alive because the because the people love him among the Telemarines. And he doesn't want to get rid of him. And at this point, there, but, but, and also, more importantly, he has no children. And he wants to leave an heir. So he, he, there's a political decision in this. I want to rule, but I also want to have an heir. Here's my brother's child. Uh, I, until such time as I produce an heir, I'll leave the boy alive because that will allow my reign to continue through my son or my brother's son. But at the point in which he has his own heir, he's born, his days are numbered. And that's when the dwarf intervenes because he realizes you're, you're only around for cynical political reasons. That's it. It's not, your uncle doesn't, not only doesn't love you, he hates you just like he hated your brother. He's doing it for the sake of power and that's it. The very Machiavellian character in that sense. And Caspian escapes from Miraz's castle with the aid of this tutor, Dr. Cornelius, who taught him also the lore of old Narnia. And so Lewis is putting in Dr. Cornelius this a sort of figure like himself, a tutor, like he would have been at Magdalen College at Oxford University who taught him the old lore of the West. And, um, and he was the one who gave him Queen Susan's horn. 
And so when Caspian flees into the forest uh, and is knocked out when his ho horse bolts under him, he wakes to this weird talking badger, his name is Truffle Hunter. And there are two dwarfs, one's name is Nickabrick. What's, what's the other one's name? Oh, it's Trumpkin, more importantly, Trumpkin, yeah. And, and they accept him as their king after considerable debate about whether they should kill him. The side will accept him as our king. And they take him back to meet the creatures of Old Narnia. So this is the whole backstory of how we get to the very present. So it's a, a very much of an epic narrative in the sense. It begins right in the middle of crisis. Then there's the background story about how Narnia has degenerated in 1300 years to the point where Care Paravel is in ruins and there's a, you know, their old um, heroic implements are in a dungeon effectively and yet how, and yet one other is here and how they got. So we're caught up in the story, a story telling us about how stories have been banished from modern life under the spell and the illegitimate reign of unscrupulous people. And so you can't help but draw an analogy between what Lewis writes about in The Abolition of Man, what's happened in the education system, to what's happening there. I, that's how I see it, at any rate. So it's, it's, it's trying to break a spell and to cast a counter spell. But the counter spell is one that's rooted in a world where the Tao still holds, where virtue is still potent and where wisdom is revered. And so we get the wise old Dr. Cornelius laying down his life for his sovereign, for the sake of the truth, which he believes very firmly is held in the old stories. There's something wise in that. Now, the, one of the things that this puts, uh, Dr. Cornelius in a very difficult position because, of course, he's done what is forbidden, which is to tell the stories. Miraz does not want these stories to be told. And that, that in itself is interesting as well. If he wholly thought that the stories of Narnia were just, you know, old wives' tales, then why would he care? Why would he, like, if they're just nonsensical, where, why would he care whether children were told them? There seems to be a sense of, and I don't think it's explicit, but there's a, an implicit awareness that he's not only under deceit, but benefiting from deceit, and he's hostile towards the God of that world. So there's a, a, a sort of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness that we read about in Romans 1. They know that God exists. How do they know him that he exists by, by virtue of the fact that they can see his power, his majesty at work in the cosmos, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So that's part of the thing that's not a spell. They, they are complicit in their own deceit. And not only that, they don't want to hear the truth. And they, in fact, they're threatened by the truth because it, the truth is that King Miraz is not the true king. And it's not even the true kings of Narnia of old that are the true kings, the high king, uh, Aslan, or the emperor over the sea. That's the king. They reign under his sufferance. He, he gives them a legitimacy, but he's the only true one, true king. And Miraz is threatened by anyone who's going to suggest that he's not all powerful. That's what he can't. He doesn't like the idea that there is a, however implausible to him, a king other than himself. He won't tolerate that story to be told. So the badger and the dwarves, they take Caspian to many of the uh, creatures of old Narnia. And during a midnight council, Cornelius, who escapes, arrives and tells them that Miraz and uh, his army is coming and urges them to flee to Aslan's how in the great woods near Carabao. Caravel. Okay, so we enter right in the middle of this story, and there's it's already uh, late in the story. Not just 1,300 years on, but in the particular event, it's all going to happen very quickly because the armies are about to meet. 
and the, and the armies of Narnia, which is now just a king and a few creatures that the telemarines don't even believe exist. And now we're going to see our talking beast to their great surprise. And then the telemarines who are going to try and crush them. And there'll be a battle then that ensues. So again, it's Lewis presenting the same sort of narrative uh, that he addresses in The Abolition of Man and uh, in his fiction about a discarded image that he believes is not scientifically true, but has a different sort of truth to it, which still holds. Because, and if it doesn't, then there is no such thing as education. He says, if you, if you, don't, if you deny the Tao, you don't educate at all. It's just mere propaganda. And it must be. Because you're going to appeal to concepts like justice and goodness and beauty and truth, but you're going to think they have nothing to do with virtue. In which case, you're going to think that those words are culturally constructed for the purposes of you exercising power. And you're going to see those that look like you, you're going to deny that they have a human nature like you do. You're going to define the human nature or the one who bears the image of God as the conditioners, the rulers, but deny that same image in them, and that will allow you to do whatever you want with those people, including kill them. And there's no, nothing that will restrain you from doing that. So I said when I talked about the abolition of man, it's not the abolition of the moral law. If you read the, the, some of the best scholars on this, they, they'll say this is the best defense of, the mor of moral law in the 20th century. C.S. Lewis gives us the good old defense of the moral law. Great. It's not, called the defense, it's not called the abolition of the moral law. It's called the abolition of man for good reason. Because you get to chapter 3, and here's the consequence of abolishing the Tao. And it is that we will abolish man, the concept of man altogether. And we will therefore be willing to do anything to our fellow human beings. Because we don't acknowledge that they are human beings. Because we've got rid of the concept of humanity, which is seen primarily in the fact that we have a moral nature, unlike the animals who have no such thing. Animals are not good or bad. Human beings are. And if we don't think that we are, then what are we going to do? We will still do bad. And we'll only do bad. And we won't even call it that because, again, we have rejected the category. So that's what's going on here. Does that make sense? So they meet in a council, a war council, and in the second war council, they decide to blow the horn. And again, the, the ranks are a bit divided on that amongst themselves. But they, and it's basically desperation. They wind Susan's horn in the hopes that it would bring help. And then nothing happens, except that we know that it has. But it, from their vantage point then, the Council of the Narnians that have blown the horn, they blow it and they're looking around and nothing, not a, no response. And so those that are more uh, accustomed to the way the telemarines think about things, even though they're magical beasts, are saying, enough of this. And some of them start to fall away. But as we know, the, the horn has worked. And what we are just waiting for is the two sides to meet, as in the four Pevensey children and the Narnians, and to work under King Caspian's banner. So Trumpkin and the Pevenseys are working their way uh, towards Caspian. But getting there is a very difficult thing for them. This is the thing that becomes then interesting, and a, and a really a twist on the old story, because it could have just been left off at this point, that there's a world in which uh, Narnia is no longer acknowledged altogether, just like our own world that will say that the old myths have no significance or importance, that scripture revelation, we no longer believe. It's like the Victorian era. These are important old myths. It's important that we have myths. The Victorians desperately know the significance of the myths in holding their whole society together, but they just can't believe them anymore. They become agnostics. 
atheism arises as well, but they become agnostic. I just can't believe it. But I know that it has to be true. So they start, what do they do? They start casting mythology. They, they go back to Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. That's 19th century stuff. Suddenly we start talking about Arthur and a legend, an English legend, and they divorce it to some degree from Christianity. We're stronger in the medieval period, but there. And the need for chivalry, form of virtue, but they detach it from uh, Christian, any supernatural thing. It's more of a weird, magical thing. Um, so what happens to the children? This is where it becomes psychologically interesting. Lewis is looking at now at children. Remember, this is a, a return to Narnia, but a story for children. He's looking at children and thinking about how children look at things differently as they get older and older. And now we're a year on, and the children we find are having a great deal of difficulty getting this. So they've been brought there by the horn, but they are having trouble finding the people that have called them there. And so that trek, that arduous trek to get to where the Narnians are is really a, an analogy for what happens to children as they grow older, their difficulty in believing with all their heart truths that the world around them contradicts regularly. They start saying, oh, I used to believe that when I was a kid, but then I grew up. I used to believe that Jesus was God. I used to say it. Don't you remember the parents that say, don't you remember you used to say that? Yes, I do. Remember you were baptized? Yes, I do. I remember that. But then I grew up. It's story told all the time. Lewis is thinking, why is this happening? Not the baptism thing. He's an Anglican. They've been baptized as infants and so forth. But, that, but the point is, but they'll be confirmed in the church, accept that, and then they walk away. How come? Why are they doing that and from their vantage point they're growing up and they're a year older from his vantage point they're accepting the propaganda presented to them in the public school system that's what's going on they've been indoctrinated now within the within the school system they say oh no we are reversing the indoctrination that you got from your parents. We're freeing you, or we're liberating you from the myths, we're allowing you to see things clearly for yourself. That's what is being said in the schools, right? We're, we're gonna trust science. We're gonna follow science, we're gonna live in the world as it really exists. But the world as it really exists is a world where the Tao is denied. Is that really the way the world is? Do, Human beings really have no moral nature? Why do they get angry at injustice, if that's the case? Why do they know about injustice before they're even told about it on the playground when they say, that's not fair to one another? How do they know that justice is a real thing that everyone acknowledges that it is? When you say to somebody who has done something wrong to you and you say that's not fair, you know that that person knows that fairness is a part of justice and justice is real. They know it. They deny it when they do a wrong, but they will certainly assert it strongly when you do a wrong to them. Jesus talks about that. Seeing a big log in your neighbor's eye and a little speck, whereas the log's in your eye and the other way around. You see that little speck in your neighbor's eye, it looks like a log. In your own eye, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't, I'm not wholly right, but but it's actually a big log. So we're, we're deceiving ourselves there. That's what's being illustrated. So they have a very difficult track to get to the Narnians at this point. And Aslan appears, but he only appears to Lucy. Now, why is that the case? She's the youngest, maybe one answer. But he also instructs her to tell the others to follow, follow you. And that's interesting because remember in the first story, which is the second in the series, but in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, she is the one who goes into the wardrobe first, comes back and tells them about it, and they, they ridicule her. And Edmund is particularly savage with her. And we're told it was because he had learned in school to be a 
a big jerk. He, he changed, Peter says, from school. He never used to be like this when he was at home. He went away to school and he suddenly became a, a traitor. That's what he was. He was a traitor to his own sister, willing to lie, willing to commit murder for the sake of whatever is represented by Turkish delight, which is a, itself a sort of a spell. There's a spellbinding capacity in deception. will make him do wicked things. But it's, it's Lucy again, and she, Aslan says to her, and we, they've been here, but this is round two, <laughs> tell the others to, that I'm here and follow you. And of course, they don't want to do that. And eventually, they come around to it, but only after they have gone down a path. That leads them away from Aslan, which they think is the right path to go, but they go down the wrong path. And Susan doesn't do what she's told in, in this, and she doubts as well. There's a little bit of wavering, and, he, and Aslan forgives her for this, but she's not wholly insistent, despite her experience in the first novel. And that, again, is psychologically plausible. You have a young child, the youngest of four, she knows he's real, but she doubts herself because of her older siblings. And that, that is, again, I think a very realistic, psychologically accurate portrait of the interdynamic between siblings. Uh, but eventually, Aslan does meet Peter and Edmund and company, and he sends them and Trumkin to deal with the treachery brewing there, and he follows with Susan and Lucy. Okay, so the women are separated at this point, with, and, but with Aslan. I did want to comment on this. I'm going to say a great deal more about this because I already talked about my strong dislike of the portrait of Lewis as a misogynist. And just note that in Lewis's fiction, he almost always has a, a male and a female. And the female is the lead figure, which is interesting. Is there something in it what, that he's trying to recapture of the original gospel narratives where the witnesses, the first witnesses of the resurrected Christ are females? Maybe. There's as good a reason as any. I, don't, I can't think of a better one. But that is the case, Lucy. But she's the youngest as well. So people are going to take umbrage at the fact that Susan takes no interest. And, so, and Lewis is making some sort of comment about girls and interest in makeup and all that sort of stuff. But you, if you're going to say that, then how do you explain Lucy? As the, it, I think it's just simplistic is all. I don't think he's trying to uh, say anything particularly about the female characters there. And note that the problem characters in the stories are, are male. Edmund and Eustace Scrub. They're the worst characters among the human characters. Um, and so, so Lucy seems to have a, a moral and a spiritual character that none of the others do. And she's the least of them, of the kings and queens of Narnia. And, and her, uh, even her magical implements seem relatively pathetic. She's got cordial and she has a little dagger. Peter's got a big sword and he's the high king and he's got a shield. Susan's got a bow and arrows. Edmund, um, What's Edmund got? He wasn't there. That's right. Yep. But he's the valiant, despite that. But he's given no magical implements, which is also interesting. So he is still accounted one of the four kings and queens, but he does not have those trophies or favors of Aslan's grace. Um, so... There's a separation of the four Pevensey children. The, the girls go with Aslan. Peter and Edmund go with Trumpkin. And they go to deal with a battle there. But they separate paths here. And when Peter, Edmund, and Trumpkin arrive, they drive out or kill the creatures that have been threatening Caspian at that point. That's the first act, is to liberate Caspian. And what then ensues is a great battle. Because in order to deal with this, 
and this, this seems to me almost a little bit implausible, but it did to Lewis as well, Peter challenges Miraz to single combat. And he accepts it. And it's sort of a, it's actually a very funny scene, how he gets goaded into it. And, but interestingly, it shows something of the wickedness of the Telemarines. His own side wants to goad him into it because they want to get rid of him. So th it's not that they love Miraz. They love evil and they love power to some degree. So that if, if you are going to usurp the lawful king, don't accept those that have had your back up to this point to actually be interested in your reign. They simply want no reign or they want their own reign. And they're willing to just wait and bide their time until such time as you can be disposed of. That's what every tyrant fears, by the way. So there's the problem. And every tyrant you'll see, historically speaking, every regime that begins by usurping a lawful king ends in tyranny. Because the tyrant has to kill everybody around him whom he perceives as a threat. Because he can't trust anyone. He knows it's true of him, and he knows it's true of those that followed him. Those, these are not trustworthy people I have around me. And you'll see it that it's part of the uh, ancient Near Eastern cultures that are based on that same sort of... Uh, you, you see it in... Um, uh, what's his name? Herod. Killing, if you know anything about the history of Herod. Killing his own family members. You'll also see it amongst the Caesars, killing their own children, whom they perceive as their greatest threats. That goes on all the time. Again, because if you deny legitimacy and God putting kings, lawful kings in place by your own actions, you have to take control of the situation. And every threat is there is going to bring you down. There's no justice in the universe. You've just broken it in your actions. So you will continue down that path. Macbeth is the great illustration of this. He keeps on killing every rival that he thinks is going to threaten his reign. And he sees the enemies everywhere. And that's because they are everywhere. Even in his own ranks. So, um, call for single combat, combat between Miraz and Peter. And the army of the victor in the duel would be considered the victor in the war. But of course, Miraz has no intention of having a fair fight. We're going to have the pretense of this, and we're going to get rid of Peter. In the pro So there's a treachery planned on his part. What he doesn't realize is the treachery in his own ranks. So if he should overcome him, fine. But if it looks like Miraz goes down, we'll make sure that it, it's a better outcome if we take Miraz out and then claim that it's the Narnians or something like that. And uh, Miraz is goaded to accept by Glozel and so Sopespian because they want him out of the way. So again, we get the cynical power politics of the court, uh, which Lewis sees as characteristic of men who rule without any fear of God and without any sense of honor, even though it's an, a shame and honor culture that they live in, honor is not a real thing for them. It's a way of saving face. That's it. Because they, they think they're gods, so they have to act in a certain way, and you can, be, you can push people in accordance with that tool. But they're not worried about divine retribution for their actions. So when Miraz loses the combat, the two lords, Glozel and Sopespian, declare the Narnians have cheated, and now the single combat's not going to decide it, and the Telemarines fall on the Narnians, and it looks like terrible things are going to ensue. Glozel stabs Miraz in the back, rather fittingly, and kills him. In the, in the melee, nobody sees what's happened, but he murders the king and Aslan appears with Lucy and Susan and none other than Bacchus and Silenus. This is bizarre at this point. Bacchus is back again. 
He, he was there in the first book as well, in Silenus, um, who rides on an ass. Part of the um, Bacchanalia, now in the classical mythological tradition, it's associated, well, it's Bacchus is the god that is worshipped in tragedies. And it's accompanied by sexually lurid practices. And it involves the murder and um, and also the of Bacchus, and also his rebirth. So some see it as a sort of a type of Christ. And I think Lewis is reading it that way. He, he is a classical myth that has been Christianized in some ways. As I say, Tolkien hates this sort of thing. You're mixing classical myths up with all sorts of different stories. But as I said to you last time, um, this is typical Protestant allegorical imagination of the 16th century that we'll find in Spencer and Sydney. They're very happy to mix, mix Greek gods in with Christian uh, providence and virtues and understand that the Greek gods referred to are not real gods. They are a symbol of something. In this case of love, sexual love, now rightly ordered. So the Bacchus and Silenus come in, and with their help, the woods are brought back to life. So not only do we have the mythological beast, but the woods are back to life like Macbeth, Dunsinane Wood. They come out then, and the myths about the, the woods coming alive, which we see picked up in Tolkien as well, uh, is brought here. And the gods and the awakened trees turn the tide of the battle, and they send the Telmarines fleeing, just like we see in uh, the, the Two Towers. Right? And in Macbeth. And they get trapped, the Telemarines, uh, at the great river where Bacchus has destroyed the bridge and they surrender at that point. Okay. So the conclusion of the story then becomes interesting. So now we have a human army who has unlawfully usurped the rightful king of Narnia. The Telemarines are a different race. Where have they come from? Different place, actually. So how did they get there into Narnia? They weren't there, but they got there. How did they get there? Here's where we find out. Aslan gives them a choice. You can stay here in Narnia, but you will do so under Caspian's reign, or you can return to Earth their original home, Earth, where the Pevensey kids are from. You can go back there. So at first, so the Pevenseys come from the Earth and go to Narnia, but here the Narnian or the other people from Earth also go to Narnia, but they go there as with unbaptized imaginations. They deny that. They go there as adults. How did they get there? Well, that's another story. He tells it as well. Now, one of them wants to go back. Aslan creates a magical door at that point. And the Pevensies go through as well. And the reason they do so is because they're told to do so. But they do so largely to, to uh, persuade the Telemarines that they're, on, they're not all going to die. You know, you go through here and it's some sort of a trick to betray them we'll find the same sort of dynamic in the last battle where people are fearful and distrustful because of their own motivations. Where they, they, they would use this sort of ruse to get people to get rid of them. Um, but the uh, Pevensies go through and Peter and Susan tell, and this is interesting, reveal to Edmund and Lucy that they're too old to return to Narnia again. They, they too, the eldest too. So we're not going to see them again. Peter and Susan don't come back. It's only in the last battle, so the seventh iteration, that we'll see them again. But we, we will not see them in the next installment, which is the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. But we will see the two younger ones. And, that will, and then we'll get a third, uh, a cousin, a horrible, irritating individual named Eusus Scrub. And he deserved the name, apparently. Um, 
And but then when they go back, they find themselves back at the railway station again. So it just returns to the, it's like a frame narrative. Begin the railway station, end up at the railway station. I guess it's, um, what's her name? Uh, the Harry Potter probably uses this in her, what's her name again? J.K. Rowling. Rowling, yeah. J.K. Rowling probably plucks that from there. A little bit. I'm guessing. I haven't read that and maybe it's not true. But um, that's major it, uh, major, the, the major thrust of the story. But what he's trying to do with it, I think, is, is uh, interesting. And the way he, again, is, yes, it's a story written for children, but it's not uh, only children that need to hear the story. Because the themes of the story are the legitimacy and the true um, virtue of courage and chivalry. They have a potency. Uh, the way Lewis describes uh, the theme of the story, he calls it a return or a restoration of the true religion after a corruption. So in that sense, he's thinking about the state of Christianity in the 1950s. There's been a long corruption in Britain. He spoke of it against it in his broadcast, broadcast talks in, during the Second World War. What Christians believe and so forth. It becomes mere Christianity. We'll get to that in a, few, you know, a couple of classes. Um, but it's not only a story, he says it's about the restoration of the true religion after a corruption, and the corrupt, corruption is none other than materialism. Just like his own day, the denial of real virtue. And remember, the battle of the Second World War is waged as a battle against good versus evil, but his own side is teaching children in the school that there are no such things really as good and evil or virtue. So is it not evil versus evil? I think that's the implication of it. I mean, it's not full implication of it because you'll see the Nazis as more evil. What are they doing? But to some degree, it is that. Now, when it comes to the battles, <coughs> note that Lewis, just like Tolkien, does not give us almost any details about the battles that happen. There's no swords going, passing through, descriptions of it through the other side. There's no arrows going through people's eyes. There's not, nothing that we get in the films. The films, there's actually real battle scenes. Just like in Tolkien, they show these grand battles. In the both, both authors' fiction, we get the encounter of good versus evil, but evil, when it is actually confronted, seems almost unreal like it's a real battle it's a call to it but when we actually get to the conflict it's not actually a physical conflict and i think he's trying to portray the the nature of evil then it's the absence of good that's what it is it's a, it's and it must be confronted good must confront evil it must confront it but when it finally confronts it it finds that there is nothing of evil except a corrupted good that's all there is there it's not an entity unto itself. It vanishes. Even the white witch vanishes. But the confrontation is what you're called to do. And it, boy, it will seem like the evil is real because the re evil has real power. Why does the evil have real power? Because you give it that power by your fear, which Tolkien says is the chief weapon of the enemy. Fear, not courage. Well, this is a story of courage and chivalry. It's a call to battle for children. Again, not against flesh and blood, but against falsehood, propaganda. As, it, as he says, the story, it's about the restoration of the true religion after a corruption. And uh, some have noted that it's a little bit like the Norman conquest of England, that like the 1300 years, it's Something, you know, there are the Anglo-Saxons there, the Normans come in, the Normans then are the Telemarines. And then in the end, they're going to live together more or less peaceably. The Normans will live alongside the Anglo-Saxons, they'll become the English people. 
just like the Telemarines and the Narnians will eventually. So there's a little bit of that there. I can see that. I think that's a, a stretch and it's also unnecessary and really insignificant. I don't think that's of much interest to Lewis. He might think of it, but I don't think it's a major theme in the story. Uh, comments or questions? I have left some time for once, but I said what I wanted to say here, really, about this great book. So I think it's really good, very artfully told. It, it works really well. Yes? 